what the world calls Christmas Day. And Christmas Day is often to commemorate the birth of Jesus. Uh, and even though we know that uh, Jesus was not born on December the 25th. Scriptures don't tell us when he is born. Uh, at, and we can, we're not really going to be talking that much about Christmas today. But to make the point that the birth of Jesus is not really what God wants us to remember about his son. The birth of Jesus was a necessary thing. Let's not come along and, and say, well, the birth of Jesus is something that's almost like Satan worship if we remember the birth of Jesus. It is not that. Jesus had to be born into this world in order for him to die for our sins. And so we can come often and say that, well, we shouldn't remember the birth of Jesus. Well, no, we don't have a religious holiday to remember the birth of Jesus. I've told people all week that there's nothing wrong with reading about the birth of Jesus any day of the year, including December the 25th tomorrow. But the first century Christians didn't emphasize the birth of Jesus. They emphasized the death of Jesus. And perhaps the first century Christians emphasized the death of Christ on the cross more than we do today. Now, why is that? Well, perhaps it's because we don't often like blood. Some might call Christianity a butcher shop religion because it talks so much about blood. Perhaps it's the story so harsh that we turn away. We do this when newspaper articles get overly graphic or television shows contain blood and gore. Perhaps we don't like being reminded what Christ did for us because it causes the small things we face in life to seem so insignificant. Whatever the reason, the New Testament Christians emphasized the birth of Christ. Let's keep, or sorry, let's read a couple of those passages. Callie, you want to get 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. Gord, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23. The message that was preached was what? Christ what? Crucified. Christ crucified. That was the message that was sent out. Now it was a stumbling block to the Jews. It was foolishness to the Greeks, but that was the gospel message. Christ crucified. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 2. And that's Gord. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom For, I... First Corinthians 2, verse 2? Oh, First Corinthians. No, no. First Corinthians. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him, and him crucified. That's a, quite a statement by Paul. I desired to know nothing among you. Now, that doesn't mean Paul didn't know anything else. He's trying to make the point that he doesn't seek after human wisdom. That's not how he tried to get them to Christ. Says, I don't want to stand before you knowing anything else except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's quite a statement. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about a lot of things. And Paul says, if, there's a, if, if I only knew one thing, the most important thing that I need to know is about Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Knowing that the death of Christ was talked about in the New Testament means that we should be talking about it today. And let's, di let's discuss for a few moments what there is to say about the crucifixion of Christ uh, that we can learn. I have some points here. If you have some other ones, you can certainly bring them up. Uh, but we'll start with one of mine, uh, and, we will, uh, and, and we'll go from there. So what can we say about the crucifixion of Christ? First, we should say that Christ's crucifixion was unjust by human standards. Let's get some passages that would show us that the cross of Christ was unjust. Even if it brought around about the forgiveness of sins, it was unjust. John 11, Jeff, you want to get John 11, verses 47 through 53? And we'll get Barbara, you can get Matthew 26, verses 56 through 59. John 11, verses 41, or sorry, 47 through 53. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Okay, uh, Barbara, you want to get Matthew 26, 57 to 59. Okay, so normally, why is someone arrested? Under normal circumstances, if we're dealing with a just society, just courts, we're not talking about corruption, why is someone arrested? All right, so they're accused of committing a crime. Now, does that mean just because someone's arrested that they're guilty of committing a crime? No, it is not. We live in a society especially where we have the saying, you are innocent until you are proven guilty. Uh, and that is so that people get the opportunity to appear in court and have the charges that have been brought against them tried in court. Are they going to be found to be true or not? Now, from the passage that John, or sorry, that, that, Je that Jeff read from John, what was true about any future trial of Jesus? What was true before it even happened? Uh, John 11, verses 47 to 53. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Uh, apparently it had already been decided what the outcome of any trial would be. The decision was already made. Yeah. We would say it had been prejudged. Mm -hmm. uh, that it had... It had already happened. They had decided, well, we can't have Jesus continue on gaining more popularity because then the Romans are going to come and they're going to take away the nation. They're going to take away everything. Therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to have Jesus arrested. In other words, the outcome was already determined. Now, how they went about it hadn't yet been decided. But from what Barbara read in Matthew 26, they brought liars in to try and uh, provide the testimony necessary to have Jesus convicted after he was arrested. He was confronted with lying testimony. That would be unjust. We, we know it is unjust if you have already determined the outcome before the trial even takes place. 
It's just a show trial. You know it is unjust if the prosecutors are hiring liars to go out and present the testimony. But even before Jesus was arrested, sin was uh, occurring. Uh, let's back up. Least are you, or, yeah, least is the back. Matthew 26, 14 to 16. Matthew 26, uh, 14 to 16. All right. Now, today we take for granted someone's going to be arrested. Who usually does it? Police. The police arrest. They're paid to do that. That's their job. However, the chief priests here, why did they have to hire Judas? What was their reason? There were a couple reasons you can think of. Well, he was close to. Jesus All right, so that was one of the first reasons. Jesus, what, he was out in the public. We'll get into the reason why they couldn't do it then. But if they weren't going to do it out in public, they needed someone who had access. Because they didn't, Jesus didn't say, well, I'm staying at this hotel, or I'm staying here, I'm staying there. We know he was with uh, Mary and Martha and Bethany uh, at the beginning of the week, and I believe throughout the week he probably was there. Up until up until the final the final night uh, before uh, when before they got the upper room and things, but it's not like he's saying, "Well, I'm at such and such a place." You needed someone to know where he was going to be, so Judas was um, convenient. But why why would you just not arrest him in public? What was that there would be an uproar? Yeah, there'd be an uproar. <clears throat> And so there was fear. What was that? We see that today in, <laughs> in, in public eye, the, the, especially with all the phones, camera phones you see, somebody yeah. getting arrested and, yeah. you know, crowds gathering around. And mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, eyes have broken up. Yeah, it, it can happen, especially if the person is popular and innocent. Uh, uh, arrests, arrests happen. In fact, it's, it's better for arrests to happen in the open because you're going to have the ability to ensure that abuse doesn't happen. And if it does, that it's well <coughs> witnessed uh, so that the, the, that's taken care of. But uh, when, when arrests happen in the middle of the night, that tells you something's wrong. And in this case, there was fear. Lots of fear to go around that um, they didn't want an uproar. They knew what they were doing was wrong. So they hired someone. They paid someone money in order um, to have Jesus arrested. It's been unjust all the way through. Now they got Jesus uh, before Pilate. Pilate finds Jesus innocent. And so, what does Pilate do before convicting Jesus? What does he try to do? What, what choice does he give the Jews? That was sort of intended, most likely, to get them to release Jesus instead. What choice, uh, Jeff? He provides How? Well, there, 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 there's apparently some uh, common occurrence at the time where he released someone that they chose. Uh, so they, uh, he assumed that they would choose Jesus to be released. Mm -hmm. But instead they chose the murder and the robbery. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Think about that for a moment. Someone, Barabbas wasn't an accused murderer. He was a convicted murderer. We have, imagine, so you get arrested, and everyone knows you're innocent, 
and they bring out Paul Bernardo. And they say, well, you got a choice, Ontario. We're going to release this person right here. This person, you may not like him, but we, we can't find anything wrong with him. Or you can release, we can release Paul Bernardo. You choose. And the crowd chooses Paul Bernardo. That is unjust. Well, so is what happened here. Barabbas was a murderer. He was a robber. He was an insurrectionist, according to the Gospel of Luke. He should not have been let go. But he was. It was a perversion of justice. The Jews should not have arrested Jesus. They should not have tried Jesus. He should not have been convicted. But the hatred of the Jews was so much that nothing stopped it from happening. Jeff. Well, the, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, well, if he comes back, you can come back. Okay. So, when it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus, what we need to remember is it is unjust. <clears throat> it is unjust what happened. It was not it was not something that you could stand up and say, ah well, at least justice was done. Death. Okay. Even attempting to shame that by yeah. saying he's innocent, I find no guilt in this man. Uh, attempted to make them realize they needed to show uh, the courage that he wasn't. Yeah. So he wasn't willing to, he knew he was going to be, he wasn't willing to let go, he wanted the crowd to do it. Yeah. So the question is, why didn't the crowd? Because not too long ago, the people uh, were attracted to Jesus and followed him. Yeah. Why all of a sudden? Well, we know one thing is, is that the religious leaders convinced the crowd. Yeah. But Jesus showed weakness in their eyes to the crowd. Yeah. And that would put them over the edge. They seen Jesus who they thought was a man of miracles being yeah. held now, apparently in their eyes, powerless, and showed weakness. That could be. I hadn't thought about it that way, but yeah. yeah and they turned. It was enough. They yeah. turned them again. Yeah, well, we, we've seen the crowd mentality. You can, it can cause good people to do bad things. We, we see it all the time. Kids do it in the playground where, where, where you have a couple of bad apples doing something and all of a sudden you even get the good kids involved and you ask them later well everyone else was doing it so i just was involved crowd mentality is a real thing and let's not underestimate that here because it's exactly what happened so the first thing we need to know about the crucifixion of jesus is it was unjust the second thing we need to realize about the crucifixion of jesus is that it was cruel beyond compare. Modern society, where execution is still legal, tries to accomplish it as painlessly and as quickly as possible. In fact, oftentimes in Western society, when executions have uh, been determined to be what we might call inhumane, cause needless pain and suffering, courts will often step in and say, you cannot execute that way. Lethal injections are meant to kill quickly. However, <coughs> sometimes it has been shown that certain cocktails of lethal injections cause an unnecessary amount of suffering and pain before killing. That courts say you can't kill that way. The guillotine is very quick. Uh, just comes down as, as, long as, as long as it actually cuts through, it's quick. Hangings can be quick, but even still, you don't do it properly. A person can hang there strangling and suffering for a long time. Crucifixion is the perhaps the most cruel form of execution that mankind has ever has ever come up with. It doesn't begin with the cross. It actually, it actually begins before the cross. 
And we read of what happened to Jesus and we think, oh, that, that's just something they did on top of the cross. No, that was to prepare Jesus for the cross. Henry, you want to get Mark 15, verses 15 through 20. So Pilate, uh, wanting to gratify the cross, released a part of us to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had forced the him to be <coughs> crucified. <coughs> then the soldiers sent him away in the fall of Bartholomew, and they called together the whole garrison, and they closed the hand with purple. And the priest of crown of the source put it on his head and began to salute him, helping of the Jews. Then, uh, through uh, verse 20. Okay. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. And the fall, falling the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took a purple of <laughs> him. What was the first thing after Jesus was convicted? What was the first thing that they did to Jesus? They Alright, they scourged him. What does that mean? Yeah, they beat him and whipped him. Now, why do you suppose they did that? All right, so first thing we'd be doing, all right, that's a shameful thing to have happen to you, is to show you, okay, you deserve this. It's punishment. That's the first thing you would think. Okay, you're convicted, you're a convicted criminal, you're going to be punished. But when you think about what's about to happen, what would the effect of being whipped actually do to someone who's about to be crucified? Yeah, that's I, I, I where I'm going with this. It would it would weaken his body. His body is about to undergo. It's already undergone quite a bit of um, torture already. Remember, he was arrested around midnight. He'd been up the previous day. We don't read of him sleeping at any point during the previous day. So he's already been up all night. We're coming up to uh, just after 9 a.m., so he's been up all night. We know he's been hit and beaten throughout the night at different points. The Jews did that before they delivered him to Pilate. So uh, he's not been treated very well. He's tired already. Uh, and now he's being whipped. He's being scourged. And uh, so that's further weakening his body. What else did they do to him? Now, why would that be something that would add to the burden of the cross? Because you're right. That's, that's what they did. We often think physical pain is the uh, is is all Jesus went through. Mental pain, mental anguish, is just as bad as physical pain. If you've ever faced dread before, like true dread, <clears throat> knowing what was going to happen to you, and just, just absolute dread, humiliation, sorrow, anguish, mental suffering can be just as bad as physical suffering. And when put together, it is absolutely cruel. They mocked him. He should have been king. They dressed him up like a king. He should have been a king. And they mocked him, saying, Ah, hail, king of the Jews. Look at you. Look how good you must be. So even before they struck a nail through his hand or his ankle, he was already suffering great pain. But... He hadn't been nailed to the cross yet. Annie, you want to get Mark 15, verses 22 through 25.
Okay, the Bible's very, uh, the, Bi the Bible's very um, succinct in what it tells us. They scourged him. Doesn't describe how many, how many uh, lashes he took. Doesn't describe every scar and every lash and, and, all, and all the blood and gore. Nor does it come along and tell, tell us just how bad the crucifixion was. It says they crucified him. What was involved in crucifixion? The little little tacks? No. No. Railroad spikes. They're, all, they're practically railroad spikes, yeah. They're huge, long nails. When you think about it, what what the way it actually is, we often see people wearing necklaces of what I call a lowercase cross, a lowercase T. That's not what the cross looked like. Uh, what it actually looked like was more of an uppercase T. They would take, uh, when you think of Jesus bearing the cross, the Romans didn't have them bury, bury the entire beam because they crucified too many people. What they did was they would plant the vertical stake in the ground. They would have a place where they would crucify, and so they'd dig holes, and they'd put the stakes there, and they'd bury them in so that they would actually stand. And so what would happen then is they would cut out notches in the in the the horizontal, the vertical beam, and they would then come with the person, and they would attach the person to the to the horizontal cross beam. They would nail them to that, and then they would lift them up onto the vertical beam, nail that beam down so it stayed, and then they would attach your feet to the vertical beam as well. It would not be done through the hands. It would be done through the wrists. If it did, if you did it through the hands, then you're, there's not a bone here in your hand to just not rip your hand off. So you'd be put, put in through the wrist and then through the ankle bones uh, on the legs. It would hurt. It would absolutely hurt. And then the person would hang there. Now, uh, if you've ever done, if you've ever swung off bars. And just held yourself up like on a monkey bars or something. Where your feet were suspended off from the ground. You know your arms are going to get tired. And we would drop. In other words, if you have the opportunity, you'd drop to the ground. Take the, take the strain off your shoulders and, and off your chest. Well, you're, when you're nailed to something like that, you can't do that. So what do you, people try to do? They try to lift themselves up. But they can't because they've been weakened. And so basically what your body's doing, there's a lot of internal bleeding. Your organs start to shut down and you begin to suffocate in your own blood. This is what crucifixion is. It is absolutely cruel. And the worst part about it is, is that it can sometimes take days to accomplish. Depending on how fit the person was when they were crucified. Jesus, I don't believe, was a bodybuilder, but he wasn't someone who was old and frail either. And yet, God was merciful to Jesus. We read he hung there for six hours and died. The two that were hung with him, they had to have their bones broken in order that they die because the Jews didn't want the bodies on the cross because the Passover was coming and that would have been a desecration to the Passover to have dead bodies on the cross shows you what Jews took to, chose to care about when it came to uh, th this scene they, they, they didn't mind cru crucifying an innocent man that wasn't bad but oh having a dead body on the cross on a high Sabbath day that would be, that would be very bad Jesus' crucifixion was cruel beyond compare. He suffered there. And the reason he suffered there is not because he deserved that death. 
it's because we deserve to die for our sins. We deserve to have our blood shed. Which brings us to our final point before we run out of time this morning. Which we need to remember that the cru crucifixion of Christ was glorious as well. Now that sound, might sound like an odd statement. We just discussed how it was unjust and how it was cruel. But the crucifixion of Christ had a purpose. It was not an accident. God didn't fail when the Jews rejected Jesus and had him crucified. In fact, it was to bring salvation within man's reach. Let's come up to Gord. Uh, you want to get Isaiah chapter 53. He's your favorite passage, so I'll give it to you. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53. I'd like us to read verses um, 1 to 5. Whom has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All right. Crucifixion of Christ was not an accident. It was prophesied. In the Old Testament, he was going to be beaten. He was going to be crucified. But through his wounds, through his stripes, we are healed. And without them, we would not be healed. Uh, Cala, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. as much as you know that you were not redeemed with the corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, <clears throat> as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Okay. We were not redeemed from sin by someone coming paying a monetary amount. Someone comes and saying, oh, well, all right, that sin, each sin's worth a dollar. Every sin you commit, another dollar. Well, Christ didn't come and pay with, with dollars or, or any other form of currency. He didn't come and trade that way. Nothing corruptible could remit sin. His precious blood was shed as a lamb that was without blemish. Without spot, his sacrifice redeemed our sin. And it purchased the church along with it. Jeff, you want to get Acts 20, verse 28. Therefore take heed yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased in his own blood. All right, so not only was our sins forgiven with the blood of Christ, the church was paid. The church was bought. You become a member of the church when your sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. And so the church was bought with the blood of Christ. And so all of this happened so that God could extend his grace upon the faithful who will obey Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All of this was done. It is a glorious plan. 
of how God would save mankind. Seeing as how Christ suffered, how he bled, how he died, we should not refuse this sacrifice by refusing to obey. Jesus' death was hard for him to bear, but in terms of salvation, it is easy for us to follow. We need to believe in Jesus. We need to repent of our sins. We need to confess him as Lord, and we need to be baptized for the remission of our sins. That is what God has said we need to do. We do not need to suffer on a cross. We do not need to do to suffer all of the pain and anguish that Jesus suffered. We do not need that at all. We must come to faith in Christ. Believe what he did and follow what he said. If we will do that, we will have the opportunity to take advantage of the, uh, of the death that Christ died and receive the benefits of the payment that Christ paid. I am not ashamed to hold my Lord, nor